And now, without any further ado, please welcome the magnificent Marco! <laughs> How can I live up to that? <laughs> um, thank you all for coming. Um, I've been revising my talk on revision up until the last moment, <laughs> so I'm hoping I can follow my, uh, my own editing. Um, the title is uh, The Train Stops Here, The Optimism of Revision. Um, and uh, it comes uh, from an interview with James Baldwin. The train stops here. You have to get off here. Um, I also have uh, an epigraph from the Irish poet uh, Michael Longley. Um, Michael Longley says, technique is important. I think that if most people who called themselves poets were tightrope walkers, they'd be dead. <laughs> Apologies to my poet friends. Um, and um, I tried to put um, most of the longer quotes on the handout, so hopefully you can find them there. Uh, I wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for the Anglo-Irish writer Brian Moore, he called himself Brian Moore, um, who many years ago was a writer in residence at the University of Toronto. At that time, I was working in a nearby restaurant as a waitress, and in my, between my split shifts of lunch and dinner, I would go to the university library to, to work, to try to write. And I saw a little article in the university newspaper that Brian Moore was going to be a writer in residence and you could ring a phone number and you could make an appointment to meet with him. So I dialed the number, took off my waitress's apron and went to his office, um, not thinking about the fact that I was not enrolled at the university. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he, um, I brought him a story, uh, he read it to me, um, both imitating all the characters and animals in the story and making larger suggestions. Oh, we need to know her age sooner. Um, you're leaving the description of the church too late. Um, I don't think the pigs would do that on page 11. <laughs> um, up until that point, it had never occurred to me that I could revise a story. I could write a story, and then I could work a little bit at the language, editing, and then I maybe would try sending it to magazines who sent it back, usually quite slowly. Um, so this was, I went home that day, and I sat down, and I started to do some of the things he had suggested. I took him the same story seven weeks in a row, and on the seventh week, I was so moved by him declaring that the story was finished, that I confessed I was only a waitress at a local restaurant. And he very charmingly said, oh, I knew that. None of the... <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> the train stops here. A number of years ago, I was teaching at Carnegie Mellon University when a graduate student asked if she could study how I wrote fiction. She was doing a PhD in rhetoric. Cautiously, I asked, what would that involve? Sarah said she wanted to sit be behind me in my small office for two hours each morning for a week and transcribe every mark I made on the screen. I was trying to write a new novel, and out of curiosity and affection, I agreed to this intimidating plan. Needless to say, Sarah's presence changed my writing habits. I didn't fidget or go in search of coffee or check whether the water fountain was still working. <laughs> During our two hours together each morning, I did what Sarah wanted. I typed. The following week, I was still basking in my recovered solitude when she handed me a transcript of what I had written in her presence. 
The week of her observation had been moderately productive. I had six new pages of my novel in progress. But the transcript Sarah handed me, every mark I had made on the screen, was several times that length. Over and over, I read sequences like this. The tabby cat sat on the mat. The tabby cat lolled on the mat. The mat that filled the doorway was currently occupied by a tabby cat. <laughs> the cat, some kind of tabby, occupied the worn doormat. The last entry read, the tabby cat sat on the mat. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh if you will. <laughs> Reading these pages, which I had in a certain sense written, was revelatory. I understood how often I fiddled around with a sentence, making it slightly better, then slightly worse, then slightly better again, before, more often than not, returning to the adequate first version. What I needed to do, I realized, was not make the sentence about the cat into a thing of beauty and a joy forever, but write the next sentence and the next <laughs> until I find out where the story was going and what the cat's role in it was. The computer was pandering to my de desire to edit prematurely in a way that I would never have done when writing with a pen and paper. And I'll just say that as the fiction editor at Plowshares for seven years, I encountered story after story um, that showed me other writers shared um, this problem. Um, the first page, the prose would be angelic, sublime, gorgeous, unbelievable. Second page, maybe a little less sublime, maybe not a seraphim, but a cherubim. Um, <laughs> by page five, the pro prose is descending towards the ordinary and perhaps even the pedestrian. All those authors were doing what I did, which was opening their file at the beginning and thinking, I must just fix the sentence about the umbrella. And then spending perhaps an hour on that page before going to the page, to page 11, where they'd left off the day before. So premature editing. Um, to edit, according to my Oxford English Dictionary, comes from the French verb meaning to publish, and we use it optimistically to mean make publishable. But to edit usefully, I would argue, one usually needs a complete text or at least a good part of one, an act of a play, a section of a story. I was trying to sail a half-built boat. No wonder I tacked so often and ran aground. There are writers, the British novelist Tessa Hadley is one of them, who produce three or four hundred words a day, moving steadily forward and end up with a manuscript that needs almost no revision. When she told me this, we were having dinner together, I nearly fainted with envy. Uh, but my informal research suggests that most writers need to work through the three stages of writing, writing, revising, editing to get their work to the highest level. I would also add that while early editing can deepen our understanding of a text, it can also make it harder to do the necessary work of compressing and cutting. Not only because we're loath to recycle our labor, kill our darlings, as the phrase goes, but also because the beautiful sentences begin to act as a scrim, obscuring what we need to see. Making art is a fundamentally inefficient process. In one, of the, in one of his prefaces, the novelist Joseph Conrad suggests why this is so, and uh, he's using his preferred pronouns, as you will see. The artist's appeal is made to our less obvious capacities, to the part of our nature which, because of the warlike conditions of existence, is necessarily kept out of sight within the more resisting and hard qualities, like the vulnerable body within the steel armor. His appeal is less loud, more profound, 
less distinct, more stirring, and sooner forgotten, yet it endures forever. He speaks to our capacity for delight and wonder, to the sense of mystery surrounding our lives, to our sense of pity and beauty and pain, to the latent feeling of fellowship with all creation, and to the subtle but invincible conviction of solidarity that knits together the loneliness of innumerable hearts, to the solidarity in dreams, in joy, in sorrow, in aspiration, in illusions, in hope, in fear, which binds men to each other, which binds together all humanity, the dead to the living and the living to the unborn. More recently, James Baldwin, in an interview, remarked, when you're writing, you're trying to find out something which you don't know. The whole language of writing for me is finding out what you don't want to know, what you don't want to find out, but something forces you to anyway. The writer, the artist, is working out of hidden parts of the self, parts that must be protected from the warlike conditions of existence. We approach that self tentatively, often reluctantly. We are only sometimes our own gatekeepers. So on the one hand, we have to negotiate the labyrinth of the self. On the other, we have to generate material. As writers, I would argue, first we make the clay, then we shape the clay into a vase. We put words on the page, finding a voice, creating characters, setting, situation, a plot, figuring out the psychological arc. Then we revise. Finally, we reach the delicious task of editing. Most of us need to learn the valuable skill of revision, skills of revision, of looking again at what we have made and seeing how it can be made better before we bear down on our sentences. You'll see in the handout at the back of the handout, some of the 16 drafts Elizabeth Bishop wrote of her famous Villanelle One Art. Um, Bishop wrote the poem with unusual speed, I believe uh, it, in the course of just a couple of weeks, as compared to another wonderful poem, The Moose, which I think she worked on for nearly two decades. Um, you can see how the first draft on page four is both partly a poem and partly notes towards a poem, turning to page three, in the next draft, uh, next page, draft three, you see the poem shrinking. In draft nine, it balloons up again, it swells again. And then draft 15, just before the draft that the New Yorker published. Um, and if you want to look at this more closely, which I completely recommend, you can see all the drafts in the electric jukebox. Is that right, Mark? Edgar Allan Poe and the jukebox, Poe and the jukebox um, uh, has all 16 drafts. <clears throat> While some writers love revision, they've built the boat, now they can sail to Byzantium. Many approach the task with a sense of drudgery and even hopelessness. Rather than make the, the work more seaworthy, they fear it will founder on the rocks. Revision is not a skill that advertises itself. By its nature, it is hidden from the reader. The works we love emerge on the page with an authority that conceals the labor that created them. One art took, as I've said, 16 drafts to reach its final radiant form. Jane Austen wrote Phoenix on the last page of her last novel, Persuasion, only to return to the manuscript a couple of weeks later and radically rewrite the climactic proposal scene between Anne Elliot and Captain Wentworth. And the original scene, if you look at it, is unbelievably dull. Uh, Scott Fitzgerald moved the history of Jay Gatsby's past around several times before he put it in chapter seven. And more recently, we have, for instance, Flannery O'Connor, whose last story, Judgment Day, is in many ways a revision of her first published story, Geraniums, and Raymond Carver turning his minimalist, The Bath, into the much more expansive, A Small Good Thing. 
Of course, there are exceptions to the right revise edit rule. Sometimes the occasion of the story is just right, the character's point of view, setting, and plot are working well, the structure is sturdy, events are building to a climax, and yet the story feels thin or implausible, or even worse, my agent's favorite term of abuse, dull. <laughs> In such cases, revision may mean looking again at the narrative voice, the level of diction. Um, do you want to say a single pine tree, a lone pine tree, a solitary pine tree, just one pine tree? Um, choosing that level. The sentences, the subordinate clauses, how dialogue is being used, all the, all the elements of style that conspire to make a story vivid, resonant, and suspenseful. The writer needs to write better sentences. The author in this situation, telling the right story with and all these other things right, can happily combine revising and editing. But for the rest of us. So why, given that it's such a crucial part of writing, does a revision sometimes, often, always, feel so hard? James Baldwin helpfully says, Rewriting is very painful. You know it's finished when you can't do anything more to it, though it's never exactly the way you want it. The hardest thing in the world is simplicity. You have to strip yourself of all your disguises, some of which you didn't know you had. You want to write sentence, a sentence as clean as a bone. I am no stranger to the feeling that there's nothing more I can do but I'm often surprised by what happens when I put a story aside. I've reached the point of thinking every last semicolon is in place. Doesn't that mean the story is finished? Rereading the pages after an absence of even a few weeks, my first thought is usually, who wrote this? Who thought this was a good paragraph, an interesting description, a complex character, an inevitable surprise? Suddenly, I can see that I didn't need the opening description of what the children did at school, that the scene with the detective is too brief, that the two scenes with Duncan are making the same point. I begin deleting and moving paragraphs, expanding a brief summary into a scene, moving a flashback. But as I work on the story day after day, my vision again begins to cloud. I've learned not to trust the nothing more I can do feeling until I've experienced it several times. Another reason revision is so hard is that after weeks and months of work, we're still sometimes, as Conrad and Baldwin suggest, not sure what the story is about at the deepest level. This seems nonsensical to non-writers. We've assembled the ingredients, don't we know whether we're making a frittata or a creme brulee? But when an editor from the Atlantic Monthly visited one of my fiction workshops at Emerson College and asked my graduate students what their stories were about, almost none of them could give a coherent answer. Often the writer is waiting to find out what happens just as much, perhaps even more, than the reader. Putting aside the deeper reasons that blind us to our own work, here are some possible reasons why a text may not be working at the highest level. And I just listed the, these on the handout. The main character is not sufficiently complex. It's quite rare in workshops to hear the participants saying, oh, I wish I knew less about the main character. <laughs> no, I know much too much about her, you know. Um, so just, yeah, listen out for that comment and clap when you hear it. <laughs> um, the main character's outer journey is not revealing her inner journey. And, you know, the journey is one of our oldest metaphors. But in fiction, we're always looking for, for both the exterior and the interior. The exterior without the interior is more like what? Anecdote? Fable? Um, the minor characters are not working hard enough. Um, Nabokov referred to his characters as his employees. And <laughs> some of your employees may not be clocking in 
when they should be. They may be sneaking off to the ice room to read. I don't know. Just keep an eye on them. Um, a key event, scene, emotion is missing. If you look online, you can find a wonderful um, periodic table of the emotions. It lists, I believe, 92 emotions. And it's interesting to see how many you're you're using in your stories, we're using in our stories. The different elements or strands or plots are competing rather than cooperating. So um, rather than working together, um, what I once described as a bivalve, <laughs> um, the two halves of the oyster combining to make the pearl, the pearl is not quite happening. Um, we haven't chosen the best point of view. Often we begin a story instinctively without perhaps thinking about the point of view and um, sometimes on consideration first thought was not best thought. Um, the plot isn't working and or we have no turning point. Turning point is a very thing devoutly to be wished for. Um, we are in love with a scene or a character, perhaps for autobiographical reasons, in a way that's distorting the story. In the midst of our own confusion, we also face the challenge of conflicting advice. For well over half a century, the main way of teaching creative writing in North America has been through workshops. And one of the two central premises of the workshop is that the, is that the author, buoyed up by all that constructive criticism, will return to her desk ready and able to revise. She will take the insightful comments and use them to finish the story. Although writers parse the verb to finish as keenly as the Inuits do snow. I, I typed that sentence and then I thought, am I really putting too much weight on the poor Inuits? We're always saying this about them and snow. So I looked it up on Google and Google reassuringly said, yes, the Inuit have 50 words for snow. And then helpfully added that Americans have 13 words for sandwiches. <laughs> you can try to figure out what those are in a kind of, in one of my longers. Um, while working on my first published novel, I had two ed editors, Cynthia in Toronto and Dawn in New York. Cynthia would phone from Toronto and say, you know, things were going fine. I was reading happily until the beginning of chapter four. Then you seem to get bogged down. The opening pages of chapter four are much too slow. You need to cut and compress as much as you can. Next day, Dawn would phone from New York. She really liked what I'd done in chapter one. Celia's situation was much clearer. But then suddenly in chapter four, she said, you speed up. <laughs> you, you rush through the material. I couldn't follow what was happening. You really need to slow down the beginning of chapter four. I would put down the phone in Boston and wring my hands. But gradually, I began to understand that Cynthia and Dawn were telling me the same thing. There was a problem with the opening of chapter four. That was what I had to focus on. It was up to me to figure out the nature of the problem and how to fix it in a way that ideally included both of them. I see this scenario repeated over and over in the workshops I teach. Readers are delicate seismographs, often Often, sorry, often a single sentence, sometimes even a single phrase, can make them feel something isn't working, jostle them out of the fictional dream. Where they tend to differ is in their analyses of what woke them. The scene you've written where your main character makes beef wellington, I'm thinking of the famous scene in To the Lighthouse, or, but I can't pronounce the name of what Mrs. Ramsey cooks. Um, one of... One, Sorry, the scene you've written where your main character makes brief Wellington brings your readers to a standstill. One doesn't believe the main character would make beef Wellington, another thinks the scene is too slow. A third asks why you've rushed the beef Wellington. Someone else argues that they don't see how the scene advances the story. 
why is so much time devoted to the beef wellington? Only to be countered by another reader saying, if anything, the scene is overly meaningful. The author, listening to all this, diligently taking notes, wants to run away to Scotland, <laughs> rather than roll up her sleeves and set to work. What she needs to focus on is what her readers agree on. There is a problem with the beef wellington. How can she include more of her readers? I say more because reading is such an intimate activity. We read the words the author has written, but we bring our own lives, memories, ideas, and perceptions to bear. When I was growing up, we had a Pekingese named Rolo who went on long walks, bounding over the heather, and kept me company while I did my homework. 50 years later, any mention of a Pekingese brings beloved Rolo to mind. Whereas my husband, reading the same sentence, pictures a spoiled, short-legged dog given to breathing noisily and yapping. When I gave a draft of my most recent novel to four readers, a parent, a fellow writer, a feminist philosopher, and a dear friend, they each found a completely different problem with the narrative. So we have a hard time figuring out what our stories about are about, and our readers offer conflicting advice. How can we get a better handle on what is needed to improve the story? Try answering the following questions for one of your stories and see what new doors, what new doors open. I'm attempting to answer them for James Baldwin's iconic Sonny's Blues. Beautiful Baldwin. Um, um, some of them are very obvious. Who is the main character? What does she or he or they want? What prevents them from getting what they want? Um, the narrator, Sonny's older brother, doesn't want to believe that Sonny has taken drugs and that he may have played a role in the taking of drugs. Uh, he wants to believe he can make the world safe for himself and his family. Um, Sonny going to prison and the death of his two-year-old daughter forces him to begin to accept the truth. Two, list several elements or strands of the story. The narrator's role as an older brother, his daughter's sudden death, his uncle's death at the hands of a white man, the neighborhood where he lives, what Baldwin calls the killing streets of Harlem, and Sonny's passionate, incomprehensible ambitions as a musician. What are some key emotions, some key words? Fear, a desire to escape, a sense of duty, frustration, love. Key words, safe, darkness, light. Are there any symbols? The darkness of the subway train, of the, ra of the road where the narrator's uncle is killed. Music, especially jazz. The, gra the glass trembling on the piano as Sonny plays at the end of the story. What does the first page promise? How does the last page fulfill that promise? The first page promises a change in the narrator's relationship with his brother. The last page shows the narrator's recognition of Sonny's gifts and a provisional moment of grace. Who are the most important minor characters? The young man who first told Sonny about drugs, the mother, Grace, the dead uncle, the other musicians. What is the most crucial scene? <laughs> I go back and forth but I, between the wonderful scene in the bar and the conversation between Sonny and his brother when Sonny said, but there's no way not to suffer. Um, so I, I couldn't answer that question, um, or I was reluctant to answer it. What does the main character feel at the most important moment in the story? Love, where, grace, awareness of the dangers all around. We are never safe. Is the title a good ambassador for the story? One of my students who'd been in Iraq um, wrote a fantastic story, um, uh, but he gave it the title of Trust. And in workshop, everybody just attacked the story, um, ran rampant over what I had thought was fabul were fabulous scenes. As soon as he changed the, the story to something like Desert Sand, Almost all the problems in the story were fixed. And um, so it is interesting thinking of your title as an, as an ambassador. I think, a, I mean, I think really a good title is the title of a good story or poem or novel. 
but a good title can also be beautiful, serviceable. It certainly shouldn't be misleading. What is the most important thing missing from the story? Um, these answers, for me, reveal several things that are crucial to the success of most stories. The narrator has complex wants. He doesn't want just one thing. He and Sonny are fighting a duel about their different ways of looking at the world. The way of looking at it, you earn a living, you take care of your family and the world of art. The elements of the story combine to build to the final scene in the bar where music, jazz, functions as both action and symbol. Um, and um, Baldwin's beautiful dis description of, of, of jazz, of, improvis of improvisation is, is a masterpiece. So tr I try answering these questions for my story. If I can't answer them or don't want to answer them, it tells me something. <laughs> Silence is information. Um, I don't always answer them mechanically um, in the way I've put them out here, but I try to think about particularly the first page. What, what am I promising the reader and how is that promise being fulfilled? Um, in, a, in addition, um, to trying to answer these questions, I find specific writing tasks helpful. I've gone over and over the scenes. I've given the characters a house and a town and weather. I've described Zoe's sense of longing. I found Matthew a part-time job, but the story still isn't working. When I get to this stage, I often find writing outside the story liberating. Um, I'm borrowing this idea from Pamela Painter and Anne, Bern Anne Bernays' inspiring book, What If? I write a letter or a series of notes between Matthew and his girlfriend. I write a scene that plays no part in the story. What happened when Duncan went to an art museum? What happened when Matthew fenced with his friend Benjamin? I write a dream for Betsy, their mother. Like prisoners, I allow my characters to make one phone call. I, I describe them shopping for a birthday present for an ex-lover or a difficult step-parent. These paragraphs often don't end up in the story, but they do help to expand my thinking about the characters. The description of Duncan at the museum makes me think again about his relationship with his birth mother. Over and above the new details, I discover that just, just the act of writing freely about the characters who have for several drafts been marching in lockstep through the story helps me to imagine new possibilities. And in draft nine of One Art, it's no accident that Elizabeth Bishop once again allows the poem to sprawl on the page. Another helpful writing task is returning to a key scene and writing it from the point of view of the non-point of view character. Early versions of my scenes often suffer from the minor character being pushed around. Uh, in a story I wrote recently, um, the point of view character Gilbert is having a conversation with his brother. He's convinced Patrick can't wait for him to move out of his spare room. And from his point of view, everything Patrick says confirms the idea that he is an unwanted guest. But writing in Patrick's point of view, I discovered he was happy for Gilbert, his brother, to stay as long as he wanted. His anxieties were all around his partner's pregnancy. Both these tasks help me to deepen crucial scenes, but they don't always help with the larger questions of sequence and structure. For that, I map the story. I do this in two ways. I go through the story marking the different kinds of writing. Uh, you'll see the list, scene, narration, summary, exposition, description, interior, exterior, memories, flashbacks, how is time, you're meant to extrapolate how is time passing or being handled, um, when is each character, major and minor, introduced, and how much space is she, he, they given. 
Suddenly, I can see that the essential exposition is withheld until, surprise, page 11, that I have lengthy flashbacks on three successive pages, that the opening scene is by far the longest in the story, that a vital char minor character isn't mentioned until page nine. And I think one of the tricks of stories and also of novels is getting things into the narrative before you need them so that they're waiting for you to use them when you need them. Then I go through the pages again, making an index of, of, of the events. Going back to, to Sonny's Blues, page one, the narrator learns, uh, reads in the newspaper about Sonny being arrested and experiences disbelief. Page two and three, the narrator's day as a maths teacher and his meeting with Sonny's friend. I mean, it's very pedestrian. But doing this for my own work does show me a, a number of crucial things. How I'm using the space in a story. Space matters. Readers respond to how we use our space. Um, I note how Baldwin sets a clock ticking and how he uses a lengthy fl flashback to both provide exposition and pass time while we wait for Sonny to be released from prison. Rather than piecing out the flashback, he does it all at once, but that doesn't mean the characters don't remember in other places. These strategies help me to see, often for the first time, how I have built the story. Sometimes revision depends on many small changes, sometimes on a single large insight. In the case of my novel, Eva Moves the Furniture, I wrote eight versions, changing the point of view, the time frame, the events, the structure. What finally made a crucial difference was the realization that given my protagonist's relationship with the supernatural, she could tell her story from beyond the grave. I'd always found Garcia Marquez's claim that one needs only to find the opening sentence of a novel and everything else will follow, both irritating and preposterous. <laughs> but, and I love A Hundred Years of Solitude. Um, but in Eva Moves the Furniture, once I began to write in the first person, everything shifted. The novel I had been trying to write for over a decade emerged onto the page. More recently, while working on a novel, Mercury, I realized that telling the story only from the husband's point of view was a mistake, as the wife behaved more and more badly, showing her thoughts and feelings became essential. It's helpful to remember how much readers do as they read an opening page. It's, it's in fact not just helpful, it's astonishing. Within a few paragraphs, they figure out who they're reading about, when and where the story is set, the psychological territory and the tone. Hopefully, they experience foreshadowing and suspense. They decide if they want to spend time in the company of this character. They decide if they want to turn the page. One of my early editors described reading my novel Criminals, standing over the waste paper basket in his hotel room so that he could drop it as soon as he lost interest. <laughs> all, this <means laughs> that we, all this means that we have to work especially hard at our openings to find just the right place to enter the story, just the right details to introduce the protagonist and her situation. Sometimes the first couple of pages turn out to be part of the scaffolding. We needed to write them, but the reader doesn't need to read them. A not infrequent workshop question is, could this story begin on page three or page five? It's surprising how often the answer is yes. And um, when Hemingway sent uh, The Sun Also Rises to Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald bravely wrote back, telling him to cut the entire first chapter, which he did. Um, here is the beginning of Daniel Orozco's short story, Orientation. It's in uh, his collection titled Orientation. Oh. Oh. Um. <laughs> And that's why you're in charge, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> right.
right. Um, <laughs> um, let's, let's regroup with Daniel Orozco <laughs> and uh, the opening of his fabulous story, Orientation, which you'll find on the handout. These are the offices and these are the cubicles. That's my cubicle there and this is your cubicle. This is your phone. Never answer your phone. Let the voicemail system answer it. This is your voicemail system manual. There are no personal phone calls allowed. We do, however, allow for emergencies. If you must make an emergency phone call, ask your supervisor first. If you can't find your supervisor, ask Philip Spears, who sits over there. He'll check with Clarissa Nix, who sits over there. If you make an emergency phone call without asking, you may be let go. These are your in and out boxes. All the forms in your inbox must be logged in by the date shown in the upper left-hand corner and distributed to the processing analyst whose name is numerically coded in the lower left corner. The lower right corner is left blank, here is your processing analyst numerical code index, and here's your forms processing procedures manual. You must pace your work. What do I mean? I'm glad you asked that. We pace our work according to the eight hour workday. If you have 12 hours of work in your inbox, for example, you must compress that work into the eight hour day, sort of like Sawani. If <laughs> If you have one hour of work in your inbox, you must expand that to fill the eight-hour day. That was a good question. Feel free to ask questions. Ask too many questions, however, and you may be let go. That is our receptionist. She is a temp. We go through receptionists here. They quit with alarming frequency. Be polite and civil to the temps. Learn their names and invite them to lunch occasionally but don't get close to them, as it only makes it more difficult when they leave, and they always leave. You can be sure of that. The men's room is over there. The women's room is over there. John LaFontaine, who sits over there, uses the woman's, women's room occasionally. He says it is accidental. We know better, but we let it pass. John LaFontaine is harmless. His forays into the forbidden territory of the women's room, simply a benign thrill, a faint blip on the dull, flat line of his life. Within a few sentences, we understand the implied speaker, the implied audience, and the occasion of the story. And we begin to understand the unusual tone of the story. Um, not um, many writers would risk the kind of boredom of, of, of the potential boredom of the processing analyst numerical code index. It does not make the heart sore. But um, with, in Orozco's hands, it becomes witty, humorous, and part of the complex, sometimes surreal tone that he is working towards. Um, Soon we begin to realize that the story has no main character in a traditional sense. Contrast this with the opening paragraph of ZZ Packer's Drinking Coffee Elsewhere. Again, we begin with orientation, but here a first person narrator is putting herself at the center of the action. And you'll note the amazing job ZZ does with exposition in these paragraphs. Orientation games began the day I arrived at Yale from Baltimore. In my group, we played heady, frustrating games for smart people. One game appeared to be charades reinterpreted by existentialists. Another involved listening to rocks. Then a freshman counselor made everyone play trust. The idea was that if you had the faith to fall backward and wait for four scrawny former high school geniuses to catch you just before your head cracked on the slate sidewalk, then you might learn to trust your fellow students. Russian roulette sounded like a better way to go. No way, I said. The white boys were waiting for me to fall, holding their arms out for me sincerely, gallantly. No fucking way. It's all cool, it's all cool, the counselor said. Her hair was a shade of blonde I'd only seen on Playboy covers, and she raised her hands as though backing away from a growling dog. 
sister, she said in, in a I'm down with the struggle voice, you don't have to play this game. As a person of color, you shouldn't have to fit in to, you shouldn't have to fit into any white patriarchal system. I said, it's a bit too late for that. <laughs> In the next game, all I had to do was wait in a circle until it was my turn to say what inanimate object I wanted to be. One guy said he'd like to be a gadfly like Socrates. Stop me if I wax platonic, he said. I didn't bother mentioning the gadflies weren't inanimate. It didn't seem to make a difference. The girl next to him was eating a rice cake. She wanted to be the earth, she said. Earth with a capital E. There was one other black person in the circle. He wore an Exeter t-shirt and his overly elastic expressions resembled a series of facial exercises. At the end of each person's turn, he smiled and bobbed his head with unfettered enthusiasm. Oh, that was good, he said, as if the game were an experiment he'd set up and the results were turning out better than he'd expected. Good, good, good. When it was my turn, I said, my name is Dina. And if I had to be any object, I guess I'd be a revolver. <laughs> I think we can safely say that this, or this gives us character, point of view, setting, uh, tone, a line of suspense, um, and many of the other things, complexity of character, that we are looking for at the opening of a short story. And if you haven't read it, I completely recommend it. There is a most brilliant scene in the um, cafeteria, unlike any I've read. Um, readers also do a lot of work at the end of a narrative. A number of years ago, I visited a class of 10-year-olds at the Dalton School in New York. I asked them about their stories, and they said the hardest part was the ending. When I asked why, one girl volunteered because at the end, you have to decide if the goodies or the baddies are going to win. I hadn't thought of endings like that before, but I think she's right. At the end, in some way, we decide who's going to win. The overall meaning of the story is revealed. As James Baldwin says, the train stops here. Um, as some of you know, I had a brief career as a deputy supermarket manager. And one of my favorite parts of the job was opening and closing the safe. And I think of the ending of a story as being like when you open the safe. You can feel the tumblers clicking back and forth as you get the combination correctly. And then a huge door swing, swings silently open, and inside there's money. <laughs> um, I was let go after six weeks. <laughs> Uh, sometimes, at the end of Demop as at the end of Demopassons and Necklace, readers reconfigure an entire story. Sometimes the ending offers a more modest revelation, which still allows a deeper understanding. One way or another, readers place great stock in the ending. Aware of these expectations, writers struggle between being too meaningful and too subtle, writing with lyric passion and or careful flatness. Sometimes the ending feels too abrupt, sometimes it feels drawn out, sometimes it feels overly meaningful or as if there are several endings. And in some of Alice Munro's great stories, there are several endings in a really wonderful way. It's hard to make global suggestions about revising endings, but writing past the ending can help us discover something that will bring the story to a satisfying conclusion. And we also need to keep in mind that sometimes the reason the ending on page 17 isn't working is because of something on page 3 or page 12. And um, given the high value we put on first impressions, I think we have to think twice about keeping our best prose for our last paragraph. Isn't that a little odd? Um, beginnings and endings are also important on a smaller scale. The writer puts the details that she wants the reader to notice at the beginning or end of a section or a paragraph or a sentence. Another important way to map your story is to look at your transitions, places where the story shifts in time or mood. 
you're giving your reader directions to the next section and also to the larger story. It's especially important not to lose them. Later, when I'm editing, I look especially carefully at the first and last sentences of my paragraphs, and I end up cutting a lot of, last, of the last sentences in my paragraphs. Usually I've already said what I need to say, but I'm worried the reader hasn't quite got it, and so I just say it one more time to deadening effect. Um, another useful revision task, we're nearly at the end, is to go back to your map and look at where you use narration or summary and where you expand into scene. Narration speeds things up, scenes slow them down. More importantly, scenes don't just show as opposed to tell, they show what can't be told. I would argue that a good scene is always showing us things the characters couldn't tell us or the narrator couldn't tell us. Most stories need both and most stories establish a rhythm between the two. In our early drafts, we tend to make intuitive choices about when to go into scene. In, re in revision, we need to ask, do I need to show this trip to the supermarket at such length? What is at stake in this scene? What are the key emotions? How does it advance the story? Broadly speaking, the conflict in a story ought to build to the turning point. Later scenes ought to reveal more conflict because conflict is what reveals the inner lives of the characters, which is maybe why we have so few happy stories. Three other key revision tasks for me are making sure minor characters are earning their keep, as I've already said, scrutinizing memories and flashbacks, and thinking about shifts in psychic distance, um, the necessary balance and the necessary balance between interior and exterior. In my early drafts, my minor characters tend either to be very shadowy or they steal the scene. Uh, neither is really what's needed for most stories. Um, and so I'm always looking to try to figure out how to characterize them without caricaturing them. Memories and flashbacks are one of our main tools for conveying the inner lives of our characters. We go about our lives, we experience the world, not just through our five senses, but also through memory. The past claims us in unexpected ways. Seeing a crate of apples at the farmer's market, I picture my mother in Scotland meticulously peeling a Granny Smith at breakfast. As I reach into my purse, I recall the large bag of apples my friend Gail brought me from her trees in Vermont. It took me an hour to peel them. Then the woman selling the apples asks what I'd like, and I buy two pounds for five dollars. So too, our characters inhabit the present moment in complicated ways. Flashbacks, when a scene from the past is played out, occupy a different role. The narrative is taking time off from the present. We assume that the flashback is showing us something that will deepen the present situation. Too many flashbacks too, lo too close together can make the present less vivid. There is a risk of the reader wondering why she's reading about the present rather than the past. One common but risky strategy is to interrupt a critical moment with a flashback. The pit bull is leaping towards Gertrude. She can see the dark pink of its throat. And suddenly, rather than climbing the nearest tree, Gertrude is remembering her mother making <laughs> raspberry jam. <laughs> um, revision almost always takes several passes. New material does not fit smoothly alongside older material. A change in structure requires unforeseen changes. Moving the exposition means you have to write a new, a new scene. Combining two minor characters changes the timing. Perhaps most crucially, solving one set of problems allows you to see others that were previously hidden. At this stage, I usually read the story aloud while keeping in Vice Morrison's, Tony Morrison's advice, never trust performance. And I look for new readers who won't be aware of all the phantom paragraphs. If Sarah were to come and study me now, I would tell her about the different stages of writing fiction. If I were writing something new, she might observe me writing an awkward sentence followed by another awkward but different sentence and another. I hope she wouldn't catch me writing the first sentence over and over. 
If I were revising, she might find me making maps and indexes, poring over printouts, shuffling material around, moving a flashback from page three to page 10, and then back to page seven. If I were editing, then there would be many keystrokes as I experiment with finding the right adjective, the telling detail, a better place for a subordinate clause, a way to felicitously combine several lines of dialogue, cutting the words thought and feel. Not until the 15th draft did Bishop change the second line of one art. Um, in many of the drafts, the second line reads, so many things seem really to be meant to be lost, that their loss is no disaster. In the 15th draft, she finally changes it to, so many things seem filled with the intent to be lost, that their loss is no disaster. She got from really to be meant to filled with the intent. Beautiful change. Um, for the most part, we can't revise our lives, or not as much as we would like. How fortunate we are to be able to revise our poems and plays and stories. <laughs>